Thank you, Bill. Uh, yes, it's good to be here, and uh, we've already heard two very enlightening uh, talks this morning, so it's been great. So the topic that I've been given to talk about is establishing legumes on uncultivatable hill country, and you'll see as we progress through, I'm going to move on to a, a science program uh, called P21, and I'll uh, give a bit of an explanation about that. But first of all, I want to really talk about some just some basic things, and we're going to go back to uh, some of those very, very basic fundamentals in agriculture uh, and as they apply to uncultivatable hill country. When I talk about uncultivatable hill country, I'm not talking about that, just that country or that land that can't be uh, cultivated with a tractor. There's a whole lot of land in New Zealand currently that is being cultivated that probably shouldn't be being cultivated. So we're looking at that uh, rolling to steep hill country land and how we go about improving it. Now Mike put some figures up there uh, that indicated just how well sheep farmers have done over the last 20 or 30 years in their increase in production. No other industry has got within cooing of the increase in performance of the sheep industry in New Zealand. They have done a remarkable job. Also when you consider that a lot of that increase in production has been done, carried out on land that is not as good as it was or the, the environment has not been the same as it was 30 years ago. A lot of the land finishing uh, has shifted from the flat, easier country to the rolling or steep hill country. So if you put that into the equation as well, then sheep farmers have even done better. We all know the, the push from the dairy industry uh, the lifestyle blocks, etc., is pushing a lot of our finishing in the sheep and beef industry further and further into this uncultivatable hill country. So the time is coming when we're going to have to look even more seriously about how we're going to develop uh, <coughs> high-performing, high-quality, high-producing forages into that country. So this is just a shot from God's own. I'm a Southlander and this is Northern Southland. Uh, and uh, this is fairly steep country where a farmer down there has been developing this steep hill country for the last 10 or 15 years. This is probably just a, a pretty picture that I uh, like particularly, uh, and so there is some hill country and that we perhaps shouldn't be developing for pastoral use, but we can certainly develop it for other uses. If we look at improving our uncultivatable hill country pastures, We've got to get our priorities right. All hill country farms, or the, certainly the majority of hill country farms that I go on to, there are areas of flat or easier land on those properties. If you're one of those farmers, you need to ask yourself the question, is my easy land producing to its potential? It is by far and away the easiest to get up to potential and you're going to get the best return on it. So make sure that that easy land, the flat land, the easy rolling country is performing to potential. As you move into the more difficult country, it's more expensive and there's a greater risk involved. There's a risk involved in establishing pastures on flat land. We estimate that probably 10% of new pa perennial pastures established on flat land fail in the first 12 months. When you get to uncultivatable hill country or steeper country, that establishment failure is much, much greater. So the risk is greater. So you need to set yourself some goals and you need to plan. It's no different to any other operation that you undertake on your property. You need to plan. You need to have goals. You need to understand what you're going to do. And you need to plan for it. So first of all, you need to look at a manageable area. I had a farmer ring up from the top of the South Island about 12 months ago. And he wanted to know what he to sow on his hill country development block. First question, how big is the block? He said, I've sprayed out 250 hectares. 
250 hectares. Had a really good fire, nearly burnt the forest next door, but that was okay. He didn't actually have a soil test. He didn't know what the soil fertility was. He'd spent $100,000 and didn't know what he was going to do. And he did fail, quite, quite spectacularly. So you, when you're planning, there is nothing different in your objectives on this uncultivatable hill country to an area you're going to develop on the flat. The same principles apply. Get a soil test at least 12 months before you start so that you can start correcting things. Select the area where it's, that's going to give you the best return. And that will depend on your property, on your, your goals, what objectives you have in mind. It could be a north face, it might be a south face. The principles, and these principles haven't changed, certainly since I was at Lincoln, and they haven't changed for probably 100 years before that. Fencing, so that you can get stock control. Fertiliser, stock water, stock, and then what forages you're going to sow. In a lot of cases, farmers will go the opposite way around. They will go into a development phase and the first thing they look at is what forage am I going to sow and go and buy the seed and throw it on and then think about getting those other things in place. You must get the, the basics in place before you start putting any seed uh, within Kui off that property, off that block. If we think about our uncultivatable or a steep hill country, the biggest limiting factor is nitrogen. Nitrogen limits the production on that country. So I make no apologies. From now on, I'm going to concentrate on legumes. Legumes are going to drive our increase in production, our increase in productivity, our increase in pasture quality uh, on that hill country. It may be perennial clovers, it may be annual clovers, but it is legumes. The only other species that I would be considering seriously on this country would be some of the herb species. Things like plantain and chicory. The reason I'm talking about them is that they are actually weeds. And as weeds, they establish very, very rapidly and very quickly. I mean, 25 years ago when we first started working with plantain and chicory, they were weeds and we selected them out and we gave them names. Uh, very quickly we realised that farmers wouldn't buy weed seed, so we called them herbs and you're flat out buying them. <laughs> but they act like weeds. They get a little bit of moisture, they'll germinate extremely quickly, they put down a good root system and they'll survive, particularly the plantain, uh, survive better than the chicory, but they both survive very well and they both supply very good quality feed. Just quickly, because grasses are always put in the seed mix, but remember, they do need nitrogen. If you're in summer dry environments, we do have the species like Coxford, the grass species like Coxford that will survive. If you're in summer moist, perhaps on your, your south faces, perhaps you're thinking about putting a ryegrass in. One of the things I want to stress here is if you are going to put a ryegrass in on your over sowing on your hill block, don't buy a bush burn mix. Think about the end of fight. If you do have a wee bit of ryegrass on your hill country, it's probably got the wild end of fight in there, which we know very well that we don't want. We want to get a ryegrass in there with a novel end of fight, one that's not going to cause some animal performance problems staggers, etc. If you buy a bush burn mix, I will guarantee that you're either going to get a ryegrass, a perennial ryegrass that doesn't have any endophyte in it at all, or it has a wild endophyte in it. Farmers on flat land are spending a considerable amount of money trying to get rid of ryegrass with wild endophyte. So why would you even pay cheap seed money to buy a ryegrass with wild endophyte 
to establish on your hill country that if it does get going, we'll still be there in 50 years' time and you're going to spend a whole lot of money trying to get rid of it. So don't buy Bushburn. So here's a farm, again, that is doing a good job, perhaps even might be too, the job's been done too well. Uh, all the tussocks have actually been got rid of as well. But the block on the right uh, has gone through a five-year development program, uh, pr now producing very high quality, good uh, performance, and just started developing uh, the block on the left, started off with fencing, stocking, getting the fertiliser right, uh, and in a couple of three years' time, we'll start putting seed on there, particularly legume seed. The other problem that we have when we're talking about developing uh, hill country blocks is that we tend to think of them as sort of almost a second cousin to our easier country. The same principles apply. In fact, they even apply greater. You need to look after those new sowings. If you do have gone through a development phase, you've spent a whole lot of money, you need to look after your investment. Continue the fertiliser applications. Remember, if you are going to be putting seed onto this country, you need to think about where the, what the plant breeding objectives have been in New Zealand in the last 25 years. Nearly all our pasture species have been bred for dairy farm environments. So they've nearly all been bred for high fertility, nearly all been bred for rotational grazing, particularly the grasses. So if you are wanting these species to perform, you've got to feed them. You need to treat them as new pastures. We say on a, on a flat land, treat new sowing uh, well for at least two years. On hill country, I'm suggesting this should be even longer than that uh, because the stress environments are so much greater. And the other thing is think, allow, think about allowing those pastures to reseed in their first couple of years, particularly on the dry faces. If we look at white clover, and I'm just using white clover here as an example, each white clover <coughs> seed head has about 100 florets, all right? And each floret has, on average, two, and a half, two to two and a half seeds per floret. So that's 250 seeds per flower head. White clover, 1,000 seed weight is about 0.7 grams per 1,000 seed. If we only had 10 flowers per square metre, and that's not very many at all, but if we had 10 flowers per square metre, and we let that seed drop on the ground, we're putting 17 and a half kilograms of seed per hectare on, back onto the ground, into the seed bank that will be there for our insurance policy uh, for the next 10, 15 years. So just think about that. You know, you've spent a whole lot of money getting those new species, new cultivars into that environment. Let them reseed in that first one or two years uh, to build up that seed bank. You know, what is it? To, let it, to shut it up for six or eight weeks. How much grazing are you going to lose? It's still going to be there after when you do come on. Just to get that seed into that seed bank so that it will uh, <coughs> be able to survive or germinate when the next stress or dry period does come. I just want to move on to uh, the research program now that we call P21. Uh, this is a, a very large project that involves dairy and uh, sheep and beef the part I'm going to talk about is funded through, uh, part funded through your levy pass through beef and lamb and MPI. The two main criteria that we were tasked with was improving the early spring supply of forage through new plant species in high, uh, uncultivatable hill country. Uh, there's some lucerne grazing work that's been done here with Derek Moot at Lincoln. Wintering systems, different wintering systems, how they can improve that uh, early spring supply. And then the summer autumn quality. So if we look at a sheep system in particular, uh, on that hill country, we're looking at how do we get more feed into that late winter, early spring, and how do we improve the forage quality in the late spring, summer, early autumn period. So they were the main drivers of this research program. 
And in that we're looking at light, different late spring summer managements to improve that summer autumn quality. What legume systems, because remember legumes are two Two-fold thing here, legumes fix nitrogen for our grasses in the system, but legumes also produce well over that late spring summer period and they're very high quality. So they, can, they are forming two very valuable parts to that system. And then to the, the third part is the integrated farm systems and the P21 is to bring all those things together in different farming systems. So I'm just going to concentrate on some of that establishment on the hill country uh, and the legume systems. So this is a program that's just been going about 18 months. Uh, it goes for another uh, three and a half, four years. Uh, it's, a, it's a science program. So some of the things that we do in these programs, you would think of probably are things that, that they're mad, they've gone silly. But we've got to try things at the extreme edge just because some of those things may come off. Uh, and we need to look at, at what's going to happen. So the new plant species establishment and in the summer autumn, the legume systems. So we selected four different locations throughout New Zealand, uh, Southern Waikato, Ballantrae in the Manawatu, Pakawa, which was as East Coast, Hawke's Bay, uh, and North Canterbury. And at all of those four locations, we picked sites on both the North and South face. We selected those sites quite carefully because we wanted to cover off the environmental areas uh, associated with hill country. So the, the Waikato site we considered to be wet, wet, except this year it was sort of wet a wee bit dry. Uh, Ballantrae is sort of moist, can be, can be a wee bit dry, or wet can be a wee bit moist. Pakawa, dry, but the, can occasionally get a reasonably good summer uh, rainfall. And North Canterbury, which is really dry, dry. So that's a site just north of Chiviet, uh, just south of Chiviet. And as I said, a north and south face on each of those sites. So, this is the Ballantrae site. Uh, this is pretty steep hill country. Uh, certainly, probably, you can't walk up that. That's probably 25 to 28 degrees slope. Um, this is the North Canterbury site near Chiviet. Again, that's the, the summer dry, uh, the, sorry, the north, north face. And that's the south face in North Canterbury as well. One of the things that was quite interesting in setting these up, so this is science on on farms, these are 10 by 10 metre plots, sprayed out with a knapsack, uh, crawled around the hills, spraying. The thing that really did surprise me here was that with a knapsack and a reasonable wind, breeze, it's amazing how straight you can get your lines with a knapsack, even on hill country. So what happens there is that there's 16 different treatments, uh, ranging from grass to grass, through to double crop, summer fallow, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, some of the treatments are not grazed for 12 months to look at the reseeding ability and what's going to happen. So some of those are fenced off, et cetera, and different grazing methods, different grazing establishment, uh, et cetera. Spring and autumn sown. grass to grass through to the extreme if not grazing for 12 months. So we sowed pure legumes, legumes and grass. Uh, some were grazed, some as I said did not graze for 12 months. Look at the reseeding, what happens after 12 months. We're looking at eight different legume species and six grass species, but the concentration is very much on the legumes. One of the things that became very apparent, and for those that got hill country, you want to think about this is, particularly on the north faces, we tend to think of our hill country as being a slope. In actual fact, very few areas are a straight slope. The hill country slope goes down and you get little benches, you get sheep tracks, you get little basins. And what we've found is that we've got different species have established and produced at, on the different environments. And on those north faces, it looks as though we may be getting 60 to 80% of our production from probably about 20% of the land area. So when you're looking at the little basins, even on a steep slope, uh, the, there are flatter areas, not such steep areas. That tends to be where the moisture accumulates. It tends to be also where the fertility accumulates. 
and the species that have established and producing well there are different to the species that are establishing on those harsher, uh, very steep slopes. So it may be that we need to be thinking perhaps about what, uh, what the benchiness is of our slope to deciding on what species we should be sowing. We're looking at the persistence of these species, the growth obviously, particularly over that late winter, early spring and summer uh, period for far, as far as quality is concerned. And as I mentioned, we're also looking at the reseeding ability. So as you can see, we've managed to get some legumes established. The, this is about 12 months ago. The first season, as you remember, was uh, 18 months ago, a reasonably good summer autumn. So even on those north faces and the dry environments, uh, we got much better establishment than we thought we would get. Uh, so a great season to reduce treatment effects. The legumes and herbs established the best, and off the legumes, red clover and the lotus species tend to establish better than the, uh, some of the other uh, legume species. The grasses, particularly the coxfords and uh, phalerises, which we know are slow establishing, have been slow to establish. The brassicas and the, and the double cropping were very variable. We uh, had yields of over 12 tonne of brassicas from an over in uh, at Ballantrae down to about a tonne and a half at one of the other sites. And that first season was very favourable on the north faces. So we're going to repeat uh, at least four of those treatments uh, from the next spring onwards. Perennial ryegrass established greater in the autumn than the spring. Were we double sprayed or, or double cropped? Uh, there was t almost twice the amount of legume established as under a single spray. And these are some of the things that we probably are just confirming from previous science, but with different, some of the different species. So the conclusion of that one was all treatments influence seedling establishment uh, and the highest establishment from sowing in the autumn on the south aspect with two herbicide treatments. So it said, this is science. Uh, these trials are really just up and running. You're going to hear a lot more about them over the next three or four years. You can see the, the chicory and the plantain have established very well. The other trial I want to talk about briefly is the novel legumes, what I call novel legumes. And as I said, remember we're wanting to concentrate on legumes. They're going to be the driver in this whole country. White clover we know is a very good plant when we have summer moisture. It performs very well. A lot of our whole country is a little bit lower in fertility, a little bit lower in moisture. So do we have some legumes out there? Are there some legumes somewhere else in the world that will actually go into this country a wee bit better? So for this, we've just gone with two locations, the two drier locations, North Canterbury and Pekawa. We're looking at 33 different species slash cultivars of legumes, uh, 25 perennials and eight annuals. We're looking at both growth, survival, and reseeding ability. And they're just some of the ones that we've actually used to date. What we've done here is that we've actually gone in and we're almost market gardening, you could say. We're actually sowing, planting out plants. The reason we're doing this is that for some of these lines of legumes, we're right back at the very early plant breeding stage. We don't have grams of seed, we have numbers of seed. So we're actually growing those seeds up in a glass house, planting them out in little pots, uh, and planting them out as single plants. We're talking here about very, very early lines of some of the uh, crosses between white clovers and Caucasians and things like that. <coughs> So it's going to go for at least five years. We've done two plantings, we're planting last year and another planting, we've just finished this autumn. We're looking at persistence, growth, disease tolerance, and reseeding ability. There's one of the little pots of plants planted out. Early results from the perennials, and very interesting here uh, that the red clovers have come through as the top as far as growth in that first year is concerned. 
Some really interesting selections of red clover there, a creeping selection uh, from that little single spaced plant that's spread out now to over 50 centimetres in diameter. So some of these plant breeding lines are looking very promising. Also some of the lines uh, of white clover Caucasian crosses. But the, the red clovers and, the, uh, and also some of the lotus selections were looking quite good. And quite a big difference of those 22 for the numbers. I scored on a 1 to 5, so the, the top ones there are about 3.3, and the bottom one uh, of all the legume of the perennials was just over 1. So, so big variation. Quite a good correlation between the two uh, locations and also between the north and south site with the perennials. And then of the eight annual legumes, uh, you can see that subclover uh, is down about number four. There are, still, there are some of the annuals that are looking better than sub. What we've got here is a location difference, so you can see that the, the ball clover has topped both the north and south face at Pekawa, uh, where it was probably the poorest performer of all the annual clovers in North Canterbury. So it looks as though we are going to get some a regional, uh, we're starting to see perhaps a regional effect. As I said, very early days and this is ongoing. Just, so just in summary, if you're looking at developing on your sheep and beef farm, ensure that the easier areas of your farm are performing to potential. There is absolutely no reason why those flat lands, the easy rolling country, can't be performing the same as the dairy farmer just down the road. You should have them up to performing to potential. If you're going to do a development phase, plan it. Spend time planning. Start small, understand your soil fertility, understand where you're at, concentrate on your legumes, and have patience. Otherwise you've solved everyone's problems. Mm. Convinced us. <laughs> Thank you, Tom. There's obviously a lot more work to be done. It's uh, what what time frame, Tom? Five year period, is it? Yes. Yep. So this is only 18 months into report into a five year program. So uh, some very exciting opportunities to happen around hill country and obviously uh, the establishment of, of legumes and new, uh, new grass species. So thank you, Tom.